again. Uh, so, good morning, friends. Uh, so today, <laughs> we will again listen to um, Dr. Cheng. And today, he will speak more about the patient safety that he was talking about last week. Is it right, Dr. Chen? Yeah. Okay. So please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming early Friday morning. <clears throat> My name is Pancho Chang. I was here last week, as were many of you, and I talked last week about high reliability organizations. Today, I am here to talk about why. You all will know quite a bit of the hows because you are professionals and you have learned all of these techniques. But let me tell you a little bit about the story of the hospital system that I come from. So, the El Camino story. Let me see. Okay. El Camino, <clears throat> two hospital, 400 bed, very small system, Silicon Valley, California, United States. I serve the quality committee, and I have done this for two years. My background is in quality improvement and in health policy and management. So let's get started. <clears throat> this, I'm going to take five minutes and talk about things that people who came last time heard about, about becoming a high reliability organization. Then I hope to show you how we do it in El Camino. I'll show you the steps that we took and <clears throat> the time that it took. And then I will do a case study for you um, how we have done an improvement project that has to do with patient safety. Okay. During any of this time, if you have question, please stop me. I am old. I do not speak Bahasa Indonesia. I am sorry. And <clears throat> I do not speak very loud. So if you cannot hear or if I talk too fast, please say, okay? Thank you. So, what I'm going to show you is some of the work that preceded this that you all are working on now. Um, adverse events, for example, and global trigger tools. <clears throat> this work builds on the work of high reliability organizations, builds on that work because all of our work, we stand on the shoulders of other people. And we stand there because we all together want to improve. Very few human beings want to go backwards. <laughs> we want to improve and we want to learn how to do it together. <clears throat> High reliability acknowledges that we work in very complex institutions with high risks. That means, for example, that your hospital has many different services. Each of the services is run by a big boss. Each of the big boss has his or her idea what is right. That means risk. There are many risks in hospital work, and you know about them. You know about adverse events. You know about uh, the results 
from those adverse events, that people can be hurt, and at the worst, people can die. So, like other institutions, like flying a jet plane, like going in a submarine, building a high reliability organization helps us together build systems to prevent, to minimize these kinds of adverse events. But first you have to have a way to categorize them and to remember them. <clears throat> because at the end of the day, we want to do this, we want to improve systematically. If we improve because one person says, I want it, or this department will improve before that department, <laughs> the competition doesn't help and it doesn't spread throughout the organization. So we want to do this for the entire organization. <clears throat> this is what systems mean to us. First, we learn, like you know, that there are three kinds of errors, okay? There's human error and there's system error, okay? <clears throat> and Within system, there are two subclasses. So two system, one human, okay? <clears throat> we want the people we work with to know what happens. We know what happens for the big system. <clears throat> Usually now you make error you get fired. This is no way to improve. You cannot fire people like us who have so much money and time invested in us. We have to, we have to do better. First, we have to have a line of responsibility, but <clears throat> we also have to find ways to educate people because people don't make errors intentionally, only a very little bit of the time. But we don't know how that happens. <clears throat> and so we have to learn about it and then we have to practice because like our children, if we don't practice, it doesn't work. And for accountability, <clears throat> if we cannot tell people about our failures and our successes, then we have not done it. You know the old saying, pictures or it's, it did not happen, <laughs> right? In Indonesia, people take pictures of everything, everything. When Gojek delivers your lunch, here, you have a picture of your lunch. When I want to get picked up, the driver says, take picture of you, right? So when we take care of people, we have to show people what we do. And as we build a culture of safety, it's important to show what we don't do or how we fail, okay? That does not mean that we seek to fail or we seek to publicize our failures. No, we want to learn from this so that we can set up a system and minimize, not eliminate, minimize, reduce our failures. That is the culture of improvement. And we have to support it. <clears throat> support everywhere begins with money. 
And money comes when our leaders recognize this importance and they are willing as many leaders here are to put resources, time, people. <clears throat> the organizational saying is the organization does what the leaders want. And this is, more, this is true in health. <clears throat> so let us go quickly. <clears throat> You've seen this before. Here are the national goals. National patient safety goals takes many years and they focus on a few, a few things. One building block, okay? Second building block, global trigger tools to use for adverse events. This is from the military. I showed this last time so that <clears throat> don't worry about this. This is just to say that reporting is important and understanding about adverse events is important, okay? And <clears throat> this is their, the military's evidence that global trigger tools help. This was 2009, now 2024. We have taken many steps. Let's think about some of the steps. But remember, when we take the steps together, we stand on the shoulders of others. <clears throat> From last time, high reliability organizations. This is what we seek to be. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we work in high risk organizations. Normal accidents, accidents happen often. Rain happens often. <laughs> But accidents happen all the time because we work in a complex place, right? <clears throat> and we want to set up, we want to build reliability so that there are systems to keep us, to help us catch and prevent errors. So what do we do with adverse events? We want to gather the information and then we want to build an organization that will help us prevent. That's all, okay? <clears throat> oh, goodbye. So <clears throat> you know reliability, you know validity, you are scientists, I am not, okay? but. This is simply to show you that to get to reliable and valid, <laughs> all of the, the arrows hit the center of the target. There are things that are reliable. See, I can hit the target, but not valid. There are things that are not reliable and not valid. And finally, we try to get to the middle, but we don't get to the middle immediately. And we don't get to the, uh, the <clears throat> middle because we know what to do. What? We don't know what to do. We are human. Here is Dr. DeMonte's favorite slide, Swiss cheese. You know Swiss cheese. It simply is a way of showing how the triggering event results in harm. That all these play into this. Don't worry, the slides are available, okay? Don't worry. <clears throat> Again, this is to ground us all in what safety events are and what proximate cause is, okay? And you have seen this. 
Usually it takes three times to tell the story so people understand why or where. I hope I'm getting better at it. This is my second time. So <clears throat> what happened and why it happened? Why it happened, Swiss cheese, okay? <clears throat> what? There are serious precursor near miss. This is how we categorize them. Um, <clears throat> and you saw that um, Army calls this, these, they call this the adverse event. No. There are levels, levels below this. <clears throat> and I will argue to you that our job is not done by simply reporting and acting on those. That is just this much of the work. The real work is the work of improvement about understanding this and building the systems so that we can detect it and prevent it and improve it. I will show you at the end a case history. So <clears throat> we want to do this in a just culture, just and safe. Just means that we acknowledge that there is human error and we set a red line of what is allowed and what is not allowed. So we balance, but we say <clears throat> that it is important for people, for everybody to be able to provide safety related information. And we build systems for that, <clears throat> but we draw a line between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So <clears throat> just culture balances between needs of the organization and the needs of the individual. <clears throat> As a lawyer, when I negotiate, the first rule for negotiation is tough on the problem, easy on the people. This tries to do similar kinds of things. You want to be tough to fix the problem. You want to understand how people can make the error. There is a very, very small number of situations where people do things intentionally. And then you say, no, you would do this for your children. You would do this in your neighborhood. You would do this for your family. We will do this with our organization. No. Can we, exp um, <clears throat> can we zoom this a little bit? Mm, yeah, excellent. <clears throat> this is what we mean by consequences. See the red line? But the first things we think about are if it is human error, what do we want to do? We want to comfort people and say, this is okay. We are God's children. If this is behavior, if it continues, then we want to educate and coach people. And if people know what they are doing, and do it over again and over again, we will say, we have no, we have no alternative. We will punish, okay? But we set the red line and you notice most of our work is here. <clears throat> Whereas when we start talking about adverse events, the big problem people have with adverse event reporting is they think everything happens over here. Punish. 
you cannot run an organization, let alone a complex organization, by finding and punishing. Let me say that again. Punishment doesn't work. Okay? That because that means that you made the wrong hiring decision in the first place. You will do that. The, the system will do that, but it will only do it for a very small number of people in a very small number of instances. So let us not spend all of our time building systems to punish. What if we spent our time over here? I argue that a high reliability organization will get you better, cheaper, faster results when you work on this side. So let's look. Human error, the way we're designed now, we manage it through offering people choices, processes, procedures, training, design. We change all of these pieces. This change takes time. We see over here in at-risk behavior where people make a choice because they believe. When they believe something, they could have the wrong information or no information. Let us think about what we can do. We can change the incentives. We can create new incentives. And we can educate people. Finally, when people ignore the stop sign, press the buttons all the time, walk in the traffic, something happens. You can only remediate or punish. We go from there. <clears throat> we know what makes things work, okay? Senior leaders, resources, engaging your providers, your administrators, your staff, and increasingly your patients, particularly if you're going to be, <clears throat> if you're going to build chronic care services as we age, right? You all are going to be providing more chronic care. Having patient participation is going to be important for compliance. Compliance, you mean rules? No, 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 no. I mean, complying with your care direction. We don't know what to do. You will help us. Building habits, <laughs> focusing, everything changes. We have elections, our leaders change. The hospital has different things that it has to pay attention to, right? Oh, reaccreditation all the time, something new, okay? We have to focus and <laughs> we have to talk together. We look to get to safety. We reduce this to one card, <laughs> one set of instructions, but we try to get everybody in the organization to think about safety, okay? That it's okay to speak up for it, that we should communicate carefully and accurately. We have to focus on the task, remember? Work on the task, not the people. And we have to ask each other, are we sure? And that doesn't mean disrespect. It just means when several of us ask with different hats, different experience, then the margin of error keeps going down. 
because we see things differently. We want to wait before we act. Sometimes something happens, I want to hit, <laughs> go away. No. Count to 10, do something else. Right? Because we will work together for a long time. And organizations that do that, such as UNER, you look at this group, you look at this department, people have been here for a long time. They have figured out ways to work together. <clears throat> okay, for El Camino, how are we organized? What have we done? I'm gonna show you the way we're organized. I'm gonna show you our annual pacing plan. And then I'll show you the first dashboard. Then I'll show you uh, our a recent dashboard. Okay, this is the real, these are real time results. Okay. <laughs> Here is everybody's favorite thing. Who is in charge of what? <laughs> the quick answer is in this hospital, they like lots of, lots of different committees, medical staff, an excellence committee, a safety committee, a employee safety, patient safety, okay? And it all, it all goes up. <clears throat> I serve here as part of the board quality committee. <laughs> and part of what we do is every month is to look at dashboards. So let me show you. Oh, this is what we do every year. Why is this important? Why is it important that I show you a chart that is so complicated that it makes you cry? <laughs> because you should see what we do every month for the entire year. We call it a pacing plan so that we can be transparent. You know and I know what we will be doing on a certain month. If I can do that over time, it's very boring, but it also allows us <clears throat> to make sure that we do the pieces that we're supposed to do. So we have standing items, we have special items, and we have um, goals that we have to look at. It looks like this is lots of work. It's actually lots of paper. But we don't have paper anymore, so we don't have to worry about that. Many trees will live. Uh, what And you will notice that it looks like there are many things, but in fact, I will show you, once you see them and get used to them, it's the same thing over and over. But you should see it. And we should do it, and I should show it to you in order to be transparent about this. This is to be transparent to each other you can see what we do, okay? It's boring, huh? Who wants to do quality and safety review of reportable events? That's the only sexy thing there. Okay, everything else, annual report, oh, did fine. Annual safety survey, oh, fine. Oh, patient experience, oh, fine, okay? <clears throat> no. If you do not report some of the boring things, then you will stop talking about them and we will not pay attention to them. If we do not pay attention, then we will not do it. 
So even though it is slow and boring, I'll show you what we do, what we're supposed to do every year. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, we do, <coughs> we have a, uh, <coughs> this, this, this is our quality. We have a quality plan and then we have dashboard measures and we have uh, letters that mean different things for each of these. But we're, we do this and let me show you what they look like. Okay, when we first started, this is real. This is real live data, okay? In 2022, okay, can you move over just a bit? Yeah, no, no, this way, oh, other way, other way. This way, to the right, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, thank you. Steep, safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, patient-centered. Now you know what all those letters mean, right? <laughs> but I say them in front, so we align all of our measures with our quality domains. Steep, safe. So what is safe? Let's look at, <laughs> we call this serious safety events. This is basically the adverse event rate, okay? And you can see, 313, okay, you can see, you can see a trend, okay, and <clears throat> as a administrator, what is the best color? Come on, what is the best color for administrator? Green, green is best color. Green means I get a bonus. I get a picture, okay? What is the worst color for administrator? Red. Oh, bad, bad administrator. Don't do that. No. No, 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 no. You see the color, <clears throat> but you are scientists. What's the important part of the color? The distribution. Right? Because if it's all red, no good. If it's all green, no good. Should be somewhere in the middle. Now, this is done by management. Management always biases towards more green, right? Because if management has more green, then less work. Okay? Still, if you don't show the numbers, no good. So I show you some numbers and I show you some of the important things. So under patient safety, let's, th let's spend our time, look safe care and patient centered. Okay, those two will come together. Okay, safety, <coughs> serious safety event uh, rate, surge site infections, sound good? Okay, catheter UTI, come on. You know, you know what catheter UTI is? Yeah, you know that it's not a good thing. Okay, uh, <laughs> Clabsy rate, if I put in a bloodline, right? And you get an infection, no good, okay. And a hack reduction. <laughs> this is a composite measure because if um, <laughs> our our managers don't like to show all the all these, but <laughs> you need to know that we started here the same way we started. Look. We started when we talked earlier about stroke. What is door to groin? <laughs> door to groin means the time from when you come in the emergency room door until we put a catheter in your groin. 
right? That's the standard of, that means that if you are stroking, we will now be able to save you. Before that, so what's the door to groin time? Our standard, less than 75 minutes. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Okay, some red there. Okay, that, that tells us this is where we need to do some improvement work. Okay, another door to groin under 90 minute rate for different, different kind of condition, same thing, but we measure both. So we can see, are we getting better? And <laughs> is it starting on, um, is the time starting to uh, break into two groups? Um, here under efficiency, length of stay and cost. You know, when I first started looking at dashboards, what was always top? you know, cost, cost per discharge, average length of stay. What, one of the reasons I work here is because this is only one measure on the dashboard and it is down. Okay. <coughs> this was done in 2022. Let's look at 2024. Remember this picture. Oh my goodness. What happened? What happened? More red. Fewer measures. What does that tell you? Are we bad? Are we, did we go down? No. We started finding areas of improvement and working on those areas, okay? When you find an area of improvement, it's going to be red at the beginning. Part of what we ask from, our, from the board is how long will it be red? And why is it staying red? But those are the right questions to ask, not who's responsible for the red, right? We all are responsible. We want to fix it. And the reason that I like this is because for two reasons, we have the same Pillars here, okay? The metrics now change. So the SS, uh, <clears throat> now we go to the synthetic measure, the hack measure, okay? Because now we've learned that that combines the serious events, it combines a bunch of events, okay? And we have enough data to believe that it is a leading or signal indicator. Okay, okay. Uh, but we pay attention to <laughs> this part, the serious, serious site infection, okay? Because you never want to take your eye off infections. <clears throat> but now for timely, look how we start to focus. Lab stat, imaging stat. Can we do this better? Can we do it faster? Sure. Okay. What's our readmissions index? What's our mortality index? So now <clears throat> we start to move down the risk chain from big, ugly, go to jail events to how do we get better? in specific areas that we can share with everybody up 
and down the organization, inside and outside. I share with you outside so that you can see what we all know. We are God's children. No one is perfect. But if we find areas to work on, let us find them. I, the bias is only what is reported. So what I cannot tell you here, because I have not been with this group long enough, is whether these, uh, what, is, what is not here. I hope over time to be able to understand that better, but I am generally confident because I can see the overall index that in general, we are going in the right direction. And <clears throat> when we look at our norms against national norms, county norms, hospital the same size norms, we look okay. But I cannot tell you what we are missing. Second of all, as our patients change, I cannot tell you that this, all of this will continue to work as our patients, we have more elderly, more Asian, more non-white patients, okay? Biases in the system. This is what you all will spend time thinking about. <laughs> the social determinants of care, why this makes a difference. It'll show up here, okay? Look, equity. Now we're starting to think about homeless discharge, clothing rate. What? Homeless discharge clothing? Yes. We send people who are homeless, home with new clothes. Why does that have to do with their illness? Because it is equitable. It's the right thing to do. If your uncle came to your house and his shirt was ragged and you gave him another shirt, you would be doing the right thing. If we take care of homeless people. It is not too much to make sure that they have decent clothing because we cannot yet fix the big problem. They are still homeless. But we can give them something. Okay. <clears throat> so we make progress. We make progress slowly. <clears throat> we look at sepsis bundles by race. Okay, and look, Asian, Hispanic, white, others. Look, blank, 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 blank. Right? Because just starting. Okay. Now you see this. <clears throat> I spent a couple minutes on the implementation that we work that we've done since 2022. <clears throat> And then I give you a case study, and then I shut up and you ask me questions, okay? This is how long it's taken us. We start, uh, this is the roadmap that the consultants give us. <clears throat> and when they gave us, uh, consultants always like to show that they have worked harder and faster. So they showed us this and they say they are actually here. Um, we have done these kinds of things already. So look, four, four implement sta implementation stages. Look what our current state is and figure out what to do. Okay. We did, they did interviews and they told us the results of those interviews and we decided which came first. <clears throat> they built a roadmap, okay? Uh, and they aligned it with the current behavior systems and we built a skills chart together. 
what do our people need to know? I will talk a little bit about the universal skills. You all will know about the specific skills such as doing teams, uh, rapid rounding and things like that, okay? Some of those are supported in the literature. Some of those are best practices. <clears throat> By the time you will do them, these standards will change. So I will not spend a great deal of time there. <clears throat> but what we are really looking to do is to build a, see, the, look at the universal skills, then we want to do, set up a learning program for folks. And we want to start to build habits. This is a big and uh, ambitious idea that we should do this we should build habits throughout the organization because steady state means that we will we seek to improve we coach we educate and we guide as that happens then i think we can make some progress but this was the roadmap <clears throat> we are very fond of work groups so we have work groups for every day of the week, including Saturday. So education, marketing, toolkit, metrics, fair and just culture, cause analysis. <laughs> what is the effect of having a work group? Spreads the care. Does every executive have to be on every work group? No. But when we are all, when we all have pieces of responsibility, then we start to learn our part of what steep is. So everybody has a piece and a job. Um, <clears throat> and even people who like to go to lots of meetings. You don't have people like that in Indonesia, do you? People who only want to go to the meeting? Um, they cannot do all of this. So this is to move. Okay. We did, can we enlarge on this a little bit? Uh, not the blue, sir? Not the blue, but this one, yeah. Can, no, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so we use a standardized process for looking at things. Well, why am I doing this? Now I have to go back, okay. Uh, so initiation, Screening, analysis, implementation, monitoring, standard startup work, right? And we list what we have to do, and then we give it a color. Ah, what is good? What's the good color? What's the right color for this chart? Come on. What's the right color for this chart? What? Green? Who said green? Who said red? What's the right color for the chart? I'm not leaving until you tell me the right color. I have some oranges. There is a young lady in the corner, busy on her computer. What is the right color for the chart, doctor? You think it's green? Come on. You are smart people. What's the right color for the chart? Green means fully implemented. Yellow means eh, almost there. Orange means partly. And red means forget it. OK, what's the right color for this, this chart? I, I have, I am sorry to pick on you. I will ask you, 
What is your favorite color for this chart? <laughs> what? All right. <laughs> Quick answer. Orange. Why orange? Because work to be done. Okay? <laughs> the red just means you find somebody else to do it. <laughs> this is life, right? You see something red, you say, no, my problem, your problem, you go do it. Okay. But <clears throat> look what's the red, root cause analysis, common cause analysis. This is stuff that you learn how to do and people will assign. Say, so, okay, you can fix this. But... <clears throat> The long-term work is here, sharing the lessons, finding, finding the right sponsor for a piece of work, okay? Green, your organization will always have quite a bit of green. And this organization has validations, okay? And it has many, many of those kinds of things, okay? Oh, they can tell people when things are going wrong quickly, right? You expect that. You're an administrator. You want to be able to tell people, hey, you're wrong. <laughs> but now we want to figure out how we're going to fix it. The way we fix is we put it into a chart and start thinking about it because that lets everybody see the big picture. Okay. I share this with you. This chart, this single chart caused the most pain in our organization. Why did it create pain? Because at the beginning of this journey, Everybody said, I am not responsible for that. I didn't do that. It's broken. Don't blame me. What is a blame-free culture? Blame-free culture, remember where we were at the beginning? Blame-free culture is only half of the work of just culture. Blame-free culture particularly for the executive, is don't blame me. No one blames. We all need to fix. How are we going to start fixing? That's the other thing. <clears throat> we have in the organization many people who say, too much work, too many things, we always did like this. We cannot, must not, should not, will not. And if I wait long enough, you will go away. Does that happen in any of your, your organizations? There are people who will wait for a problem to go away. <clears throat> what we want to do is not to make people work quick. We would like it. We want people to understand together. We, this is the whole list of problems. We have to start. We want to start somewhere. And we know, since we are God's children, that we do some things well already. We have things that we need to work on. And this is new. So what does red mean here? Red means we've never done it before. That's all. And orange is where you, the managers, will get most of your leverage because you're making change that has already started. <laughs> so we do... <coughs> universal skill training for the entire workforce. How long does that take? It actually takes two days. 
Okay. And we are, <clears throat> you mean even doctors? Even doctors, the smartest people in the world. And you know that surgeons are even smarter. Uh, <laughs> two days. We start with individual with universal skills, and then we do uh, specific skills for people who have group work to do. But universal skills, okay. See, all staff, they say two hours in person, turned out to be two days, okay? <clears throat> uh, it's taught, taught by, we do trainer of trainers, you know that. And we do medical staff. And so these are, the, these are the techniques. These are ways of communication, speak up for safety, communicate accurately. So use SBAR. Do you know about SBAR? The way to describe a problem, okay? Situation, behavior, analysis, resolution, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <coughs> repeat back, right? How do I know that you know by telling me back what I just said? Uh, number and letter, you have no idea, particularly in Silicon Valley where there are many people for whom English is not first language. So um, you have to use common numbering, common letter. So we use military, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, you know, and when we use number, we have a standard form. Anything with a zero value at the beginning, we have to say zero point dot dot, not point five five, but zero point five five. So no mistake listening, okay? <clears throat> Same uh, conflict, conflict management techniques. Learn to focus, say it's okay to ask questions, wait before we start to scream, and do cross checks with each other. Right? We're in a team, we talk to each other all the time. You all are talking right now. You say, this old person talking, boy. Okay? We talk to each other. Okay? <clears throat> Here's our KPIs. KPIs. You actually, do you use KPIs, key performance indicators, when you work? This is more pain. Here's how we started, okay? Look, look at our serious safety event. You can see the trend over time. It's about one and a half. It's, you know, what's helpful for these charts, these run charts is, you know, what is good, what is bad. If I want to lie to you, I don't tell you the direction. I don't put labels on my graphs. I do many sneaky things. If we are going to be frank with each other, honest with each other, we are going to tell each other what is a good trend, what is a bad trend. That's why we put colors. Okay. And we count things like patient falls, patient falls with injuries, near miss. <clears throat> You'll notice, for example, that near miss, the number starts very low. Okay, and then it starts to go up. People think that's bad. No, that's because near miss is an, is an improvement opportunity. You want to get in front of your problem, so you want to look at the near miss. So you want that number to go up so you can figure out if you're going to still have more work to do. Because when we run out of work, then we have to go to a meeting. Okay. <clears throat> Last part. Building a perineal pacing plan. Big words. 
What's perineal? <coughs> What's this? Well, this is actually uh, what I'm sharing are the board slides that the manager, uh, actually our director of uh, quality, who is an obstetrician, uh, brought to us. So she says, 2020, we have a problem with perineal injuries, okay? What's the big problem? Laceration, okay? And what did we do? We looked at them, we built a report from our electronic medical records, and then we uh, looked at how we, are, we did a deep dive into the problem and looked at what, uh, what's happening immediately. And then we went a little bit further and we did individual chart reviews just so we could, a group outside could get their hand on the problem. <clears throat> We also, because we have to act while we're studying, right? You cannot let this sit. We also started doing things because obstetricians know about lacerations and they know some of the ways that you help uh, prevent and improve that. So <clears throat> we started building processes for warm compress, one of the known ways to help. Uh, we got smart people from a new and up and coming university called Stanford uh, to try to uh, help us. And we built a nutritional guide just in case, uh, because many of our patients are Asian women. Um, and we started doing, <coughs> um, sharing the data internally, unblinded data and uh, did a study of vaginal dilators and episiotomy. And we started, working, um, <clears throat> we started working with individual providers who had a, uh, a higher than average laceration rate. Again, we don't want to name them. We don't want to single them out. We don't want to work on an improvement plan. We want to understand how they do it. And when they know what their high rate is, why they, th why they think it happens. What did we find out? We found out that we were higher than average, but lower than the county, okay? So two indicators, vaginal tr uh, delivery with instrument and without an instrument. This is actual raw data, okay? Um, <clears throat> and you can see where we are. The premier is the uh, national comparison group. And then um, for California, the state of California measures, and we are kind of, uh, we're a little bit higher, okay, but uh, lower, lower than the county average. This is for us as a system. This is for other hospitals. These are as many comparators as we could find. So we just, we wanted to see what, what, what the numbers look like. Here's our favorite. This is a run chart, okay? Which way do run charts look to make administrators happy? What does a run chart have to look like? It has to go down. Does any run chart ever go down in real time? No, because there's noise involved. There are actions involved. <laughs> if you were not happy about El Camino, what would you say? You would say, here's the baseline. Why are we so high? And that's the question that we're trying to answer. We're also trying to answer the, this question. Why is it bouncing? Okay. So you need a run chart to figure out where to go. 
Here's what we, what we found from our internal analysis. Okay, we pay attention to third and fourth degree lacerations. We looked at deliveries and we looked at whether or not uh, instruments were involved. We counted the number of episiotomies and we broke the episi episiotomies out. Okay. Anything that you would do differently? Would you add to this if you were thinking about it? Maybe. But this was the result of a group of people looking around, trying to figure out, okay, we have a high incidence of third and fourth degree lacerations. What are we, why did it happen and what are we going to do about it? What's the answer? Well, we went to ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and we found that the, when they did a meta-analysis, the big reasons for um, lacerations were forceps delivery, vacuum-assisted delivery, increased fetal weight, and then first baby Asians, labor induction, epidurals, or baby in a bad position, okay? So <clears throat> we broke them into areas and we started looking at ways to uh, change this. So we wanted to, we started to use, we said, let's start using the compresses right away. And let's be very careful about, uh, or set a goal to decrease the use of episiotomies about uh, making the laceration because that's where that's when you cut, it's where things happen, okay? Uh, <clears throat> these are, and this is the weasel language. Weasel? What is weasel? All committees have ways to say, but don't believe all of this. That's the weasel. So, so you shouldn't believe all of these things because you can't modify some, you can't change some of this stuff. Okay, okay. Asian women, 64% of our OBs, 76% of the lacerations. Maybe it's because the women have the shortest perineal body length. Short people, more danger. Nah. Okay, here we are. This is, it doesn't show you the total land but it tells you uh, where we are. <coughs> okay. And then it shows you, this shows you that we have four times the California average of Asian women um, broken a bunch of different ways. <coughs> El Camino, the county, our system, up and down the coast, different kinds of hospitals, NICU levels, delivery volume. <clears throat> all the different ways you can cut it. Here's what we find. Risk level, twice the average. <clears throat> but we do it about average for the population. And then when we drill down, we see what... Uh, how we do it in our different campuses. We look at different uh, risk factors and do run tables for that. And so we see, okay, is it the result of having uh, operative vaginal deliveries? Mm, not really. Is it, uh, and why do you do it? To avoid sections. Um, we deliver lots of South Indian babies and South Indian mothers demand uh, sections, ask for it. So, episiotomy, episiotomy trends with it. We are a little bit higher, but most of the, uh, most of the women are at higher risk. 
and, but episiotomies are where we can do better. Let's figure out how that happens. So these are the things that we're doing now. We keep reviewing. Uh, we're looking at episiotomy use. We're, now we're starting to track warm compress uses and we're getting recommendations together. Uh, we're also trying a new vaginal dilation device uh, that uh, is in test at Stanford. Uh, and we are working with our midwives. And important here, we're letting everybody know. What? Aren't there patient confidentiality things? Is it, it's unblinded but confidential. We want to get better. So if we have to apologize to our patients or if we have to acknowledge error, we're ready to do that, but we want to share the knowledge among each other, okay? Here's what we're looking to do. We're looking to go down to 15%, okay? Um, <clears throat> by 2020, year to date 21, uh, we tracked this, and uh, last I looked, we're around 18%. That's my case history. That's my talking at you. You must have questions because I have talked for entirely too long. Uh, we are on. Uh, we are. We are, we are being recorded. <laughs> Thoughts? Questions? You have a question. I'm handing you there. <laughs> <laughs> One question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, maybe a simple question about uh, what is the meaning of initiative uh, to decrease uh, number four, develop recommendation for ma management of perineum or perineal message. What is perineal message? Massage, yes. Okay, uh, and how that uh, initiative could improve or prevent a uh, third or fourth degree of laceration? Different degrees? Third and fourth degree of laceration. How could that miss massage could prevent the laceration? We don't know. <laughs> we have information from providers that the massage will help, also that it will <laughs> help relax the area, but science not there yet. Want to try? Because again, <laughs> so practice, as you know, is art. This is what our providers say they think will, will work. We want to try, then we make a recommendation. And if it works, then we incorporate it, and then we set up a test. In my other life, if we do this right, we will set up a comparative effectiveness analysis. But just like tracking adverse events, tremendous amount of work. If we're gonna work on the problem quickly, then we have to try many things that could work. These are wiggle terms because what we want to say to people is we want to reduce, we want to minimize error, but we also don't know. And for a provider and for a hospital system to say this in public, 
is very difficult. So that's why we start. And we start, the other thing is, politically, we start with massage because it is easy. Right? If we start with a hard recommendation, you notice the first two things we start with, warm compress, massage. All these things, the, both these things give comfort. Very few complaint. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if it works, good. Then we have more trust and we can take next step. If it doesn't work, well, we have other things that we do in the background to look at. Questions? Morning. I have two boys have asked questions. No girls have asked questions yet. That is wrong. I cannot allow that. So be ready. Next question. Okay, so uh, I want to ask about uh, the Swiss cheese model that uh, has some holes in there, but another layer, some holes in another. And uh, if some mistake happen uh, in one layer, it may be stopped at another layer. But uh, usually in in here, maybe in my hospital, uh, if uh, something happen and hold it, a mistake hold it at some layer, uh, they describe it as near miss. Is that correct, sir? Uh, if maybe uh, there's uh, several layer, uh, for example, about giving the drug for the patient, the painkiller, and uh, the pharmacist uh, write the etiquette, uh, this is for Mr. A, and the nurse uh, read it, but uh, after read, uh, she carelessly put in another, but another nurse look at, say, oh, no, it's for Mr. A, not Mr. P. Oh, that's near miss. Is that categorized as, as near miss or not? There is, uh, there are different kinds of knowledge. So, um, <clears throat> and we want to, uh, we cannot, know what is right, uh, the right thing at the right time at the beginning. So this is a process to find out what the group does, not just one provider, to standardize by group. And because groups have internal bias, we want to look outside and see what national practice is like. We also want to look at literature to see who has done the trial. Very few behavioral trials of this. <laughs> so I come from software. So, Software development is move quickly, break things. But Google uses A-B test as the quick and dirty method of figuring out. So when nurse says, I don't do things that way, we have to learn different ways to come <coughs> rather than face-to-face -face on the side of the problem to figure out how we're going to, how we will do this together. Doesn't mean we are going to agree at the beginning. It means we have to figure out how to move forward, okay? No is not an acceptable answer. How, okay? When the rule we have is five to one. Five to one, five yes, one no. 
We cannot keep working together if there is a person in our group who uses up all the no's. Think about this. In families, in everywhere, to build trust, you have to say yes to each other. <laughs> if you don't say yes, goodbye. If we're going to work together over time, okay, we're going to say no to each other. No is human, but one for every five. Okay. Does that help? A little bit. Okay. Now, <laughs> no, none of the women wish to make eye contact with me. <laughs> I apologize. But I think that it is very important, since you hold up half the world, that you must have some question. And I want to make sure there is time and space for this, because sometimes these are difficult. It is difficult to say something or to wonder why. I ask. Do you have a question? Yes. I can come to you. You look to me. I give you. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Wuri. Uh, actually, I'm. I was uh, from epidemiology, epidemiology from this campus, but. And now I'm taking my PhD in pharmacy and I have a plan to do research in adverse fun in corticosteroid corticosteroid adverse one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, the side effect of corticosteroid. And I would like to develop a model to predict uh, the at the events of of side effect of corticosteroid using the triangle epidemiology uh, approach because I see a lot of research uh, that already published in in, in global research uh, only use uh, not comprehensive uh, approach to to identify and assess analyze the risk factor of adverse event but i would like to use a comprehensive approach uh, from this triangle epidemiology which uh, which is classify the factors from three aspects from host, a chain, and also from the patient. But then I find I find a difficulty in this research because I have to interview uh, the doctors, also the pharmacists, and the health uh, health practice, other health practice. But but I found that most of them reject <laughs> to. To go up, uh, yeah, uh, to be the part participant of this research, so I only I only allow to uh, interview the patient, uh, but this is this is very 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 hard for me <laughs> because in my in my in my view, I think this. This event is already uh, uh, caused by multi factors, uh, multi factors uh, that build this side effect events uh, simultaneously. So, what should I do <laughs> in order to 
to apa ya to able to do my research because I need to inf- interview all the people that uh, apa sih engage in this in this care I think thank you you choose very difficult approach to a very hard problem <clears throat> sometimes when we try to break down the problem we say you can choose easy problem hard approach or <clears throat> hard problem easy approach what i hear is you choose both sides um and what i wonder is as epidemiologist um <clears throat> which side of the problem is easier for you to solve first because we have to start somewhere and starting means getting initial raw results to see whether we should keep moving ahead but because time keeps moving you cannot gamble everything on one approach or one problem and as a administrator i ask people to think about breaking your big issue into smaller issue and finding the one that you are comfortable with doing first you will find other perspectives to dealing with your big harder problem but first you should experience doing something that you will succeed at there <laughs> because engineers say you have to break your problem down and you as doctoral person you face the big problem you know you have to do original research you have to find database you have to ask original question these are all difficult things so have you chosen your topic then good well then you may want to spend a little bit of exploratory time thinking about your uh <coughs> where your data will come from because um <clears throat> the other part of phd is uh <clears throat> learning how to move around the rock right if it's big rock you cannot go through the rock you can go over you can go around i don't want you to have too many rocks other question i'm going to this side please no one no one has questions oh come on then may i ask you a question <coughs> for your very good hospital is high reliability a something to consider oh Well, in in every um, event, whether it is adverse event or near miss events, and um, complaints, we always uh, 
take it into a discussion group, especially to the uh, departments involving. We talk, we discuss about it, and then we always learn things and we do evaluation what uh, what to do to prevent it to happen again. And um, we try to communicate it with the patients, but mostly um, not with near miss events <laughs> because yeah, near miss events means um, the patient, yeah, so they uh, normally do not know about it, but um, especially for complaints, we always, yeah, ask them to meet with us and then, yeah, sit together and then we try to communicate it because, and um, from our experience with good communication, everything will be okay. Yeah, and um, also our manager will come to the patient first before anything bad happen or before the complaints happen. So we already built a relationship with them and it reduces the complaints a lot. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to ask the big ones. Your English, but that's okay. If you want to, you can use Bahasa Indonesia. Somebody will help. My question is, as you listen to high reliability, would Udan ever, Udan has already taken many of those steps. Is your, your hospital, Udan, uh, has taken many of those steps. Uh, what would you like to do next? Uh, as usual, we do the uh, reporting the incident and after that we have discussion and we socialization about the incident every two months to every uh, chief in hospital and then we try to find the solution for the next so it can it cannot happen again and as you say that if the system is not good we will improve the system but if it happens on the same person and always uh, happen again we Uh, we punish, punish. So I think that you give us the the recommendation when we have to make the line. This is a reckless behavior or not? Uh, I think we also socialization to the team. If you have reckless behavior, we have to punish. But if the system is not uh, good, then we will improve. But we have not um, make chart like you, yours. It's a very complex chart, <laughs> in my opinion. And I think this is a very, very new, it's new for me to look this chart. 
tobat. Oh ya. Yeah. So I just wonder how to uh, measure the culture of patient safety if I look the chart uh, there are many scores how can how you get the score for the chart do you uh, use survey or something else You ask very good question. The question is, how do we know the number? Where do you get this number from? And you can tell this is a doctor because what I don't show you behind these charts uh, are each chart has a list of data sources because nobody will agree until you can see it all. But <laughs> you put behind the chart and it will take two or three meetings for people to stop talking about the data, the, why the data is not right because the group has to take joint responsibility. It can two years for people to throughout the hospital to see all these numbers. They have seen dashboard numbers for five years. That's okay. They have to know that everybody gets the number. But you see the difference. Before the dashboard, same thing, time after time after time. This time, <clears throat> the quality dashboard changes. Same pillars, steep, right? But different areas to measure. That is because now we are in the second of three stages to get used to this. The first stage will be, I don't like the number. That's okay. You put the number, the data source, you leave it there, and it will take at least three meetings before people will stop arguing with the data source and start thinking together about what can we do? Because our job is to get people from the, <clears throat> this is the wrong number, or this is a bad number, or this number could never, we could never fix this number to, this is our number. when it is our number and we can see how other people do, we can build an answer together, but we have to start thinking side by side. So yes, <laughs> the system doesn't change like this and the system does not change with the big data. Right, You have to pay attention to adverse event rate, to the serious safety event rate. But quickly, we want to move away from that to where we can make, where we can do the real work. The real work is not just in keeping an eye on the serious events. They will happen 
and there will be a small number of them. You don't need big committee to deal with small intermittent event, but you need a big group of people to deal with the whole culture. So if you want to move from serious event, from adverse event, to near miss, to near near miss, this is where the improvement happens. Here, there is a natural rate. God forbid, serious things happen. We can minimize that. We can make it as small as possible. We will do that. That's part of the work. But the things that lead up to that work, that's where our improvement opportunities are and where we can build the culture, a culture, a just culture and a culture of safety that says, we will do this rather than you look at that big, big, big dashboard and you say, cannot do anything. This is only a picture of the environment that we work in. We can do things about this. And you can start to pick out because you are the manager, you own this. You can pick out what you want to work on. I give you the example of laceration because something we can do, okay? I tell you the story about clothes for homeless, something we can do. Let us do something. Otherwise, we're just going to keep meeting. And we cannot keep meeting. We have to act. And you are the people who can do that acting because you are the leaders of your hospitals. Okay? People want to follow the leaders. And they will follow you. <laughs> but you will help them act. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sometimes we talk together. Sometimes I talk to you. <clears throat> now I'm going to sit down if we want to talk. Come on. Come talk. Okay? But no more of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang, for um, the knowledge that you have shared with us. Um, and it will be very useful for us to be, hopefully, <laughs> to be implemented in our hospitals and um, as our evaluation to our system. Like yesterday, you have talked also uh, to our hospitals and um, it made us uh, think that we need to reevaluate, like um, in doing our RCA, so that we can really find out the root cause of each event, not always human errors. <laughs> and um, if, it, if it is human error, then is it? Yeah, right. Because as you know that um, in Indonesia, mostly it is always human errors and uh, the result is always coaching and coaching. <laughs> no, yeah, it's the, as, as I said before, like in the U.S., 80%, the result is system error. <laughs> and only like 20% is human error. But in Indonesia, it's not like that, right? <laughs> Mostly it's human error. <laughs> That's a very interesting debate because everybody has systems. Now, we use more technology, okay, and that creates another level of errors. But I argue that all of this is human. So as you and all of you are going to build systems for the rest of your career, 
and you will have more tools than I ever had and more knowledge. So thinking about how we do this together as a team allows us to think about how we're going to drive for results. I work in startups now, <clears throat> and startups, as you know, get a lot of money to fail fast, okay? <laughs> I work in a culture where there is, uh, there is a business model for failure. There is not a business model for failure in hospitals, okay? But still, we have to fail. We have to look at where we could do better to change our system. Take this, take all of these tables, okay? Because they are not, uh, <clears throat> they do not all fit everything about Indonesia, but there are pieces. I want you also to see a pacing plan. So you can say to everybody, who does what, when, how often? And the pacing plan is for the bosses, for the Dalaban, right? When the, in China, it's not customary for the boss to say anything. I'm going to do this at this time, bosses. No, when the boss says, this is what I commit to do, and when I commit to do it, then other people start to think, oh, that can be okay. We go the same way. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, we need to share it also to our colleagues in our hospitals because um, these people who, who are participating in the analysis process, they they may not know about, you know, uh, they are just focusing on the failure. That's why uh, the conclusion is always human errors. <laughs> and maybe not all the table can be impl implemented in Indonesia, but we can take some, learn some and take some, which one suits us. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Dr. Cheng. Please give applause for Dr. Cheng.